everything How you live and how you die Love can make the summer fly Or a night seem like a lifetime Yes, love, love changes everything Love changes everything from aspects of love. And on that topic, we speak to one of the stars now, Kevin Colson. Welcome home, Kevin, from Bruce and myself. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Bruce. Lovely to be on your station. Well, it I... must be 30 years since you were in Melbourne last. It was 28. 28 years. Actually, it was April the 2nd, 1965, when I departed these shores and went off to learn how to speak like an Englishman. Where, where do you call home now, Kevin? Well, I was always Australia, and Sydney particularly, which is where I come from. Um, but I have really based myself in London for the past 28 years. Uh, but times are changing, and uh, my plan is that I'm going to re-establish myself back here if I can. Well, the one thing we all have in common, this conversation, and that's the great days of television. I, I hope they were for you, Kevin, at Channel 9. They were great fun. In fact, I have just returned from a glorious drive through the Dandenongs. I went up to uh, Hillsville Sanctuary and then up to the Dandenongs and I was up there at about just before six o'clock as the sun was setting over the city and I've never been up there and watched that site and the only time I've, the last time I was in the Dandenongs I was working for the Nine Network as, uh, as a fill-in announcer or news reporter because the newsman was sick and I had to fly in a helicopter up into the Dandenongs during terrible bushfires flying right down into the smoke and trying to do some kind of news reporting while there was a film cameraman filming beside me for the evening news bulletin. And that was the last time I was up there. Um, it's, it's so glorious up there, isn't it? Yes, it certainly is. Cool. But that took me back to my television days. Yes. Well, Kevin, let's go way back to the very start. Was uh, show business always in your blood? Not really, no. I don't think there's anyone in my family that was ever in show business. Where did you go to school, for example? I went to school in Hurstful in Sydney. Um, in fact, just had a reunion with my sixth class of 1950. And uh, there were about 20 of them got together with my form teacher then. And we had a barbecue recently in Sydney, and it was glorious to see them all. In fact, I took my very first ever girlfriend along with me. I rang her up and I said, get rid of the grandchildren and come on, you're on a hot date. The grandchildren? Who is this? And she said, I, I said, it's Kevin, your very first ever boyfriend. Now, come on. <laughs> what, what? Going back to see the mates from school. Was your first job associated with show business? Was it radio or? No, it wasn't. I, I came out and didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in radio. But my parents didn't really approve of that. They didn't like it. So I... I took the first job that I saw advertised in the newspaper, which was a junior sales representative for the Australian Gaslight Company. And I ended up managing a showroom in Cogra in Sydney, uh, at which time I then started to wangle myself into, into television through um, presentation announcing on the Seven Network. Was this in Sydney originally? It was all in Sydney, yeah. But I was a great gas salesman, I tell you. <laughs> so who wooed you to Melbourne and how? Who moved me to Melbourne? That was me. It was my decision. I just decided that I'd, I'd had enough of what I was doing as a presentation announcer in, uh, in Sydney. Um, was it Colin Bednall who employed you first at GTV, Kevin? Uh, no, not 2GB. I wasn't a 2GB. I, oh, no, GTV. A GTV, no, yeah. I, I wasn't a GTV. I was at the, H, uh, at the ATN7 in Epping. I went up there, and uh, I can't even remember who first employed me, but I remember recently, I think the chief buyer of programs is Glenn Kinging, and Glenn, I remember, was running around as a kind of gopher in the station when I was there in the late 50s. Of course, it was early days of television, black and white and all of that, everything live, commercials were live, and um, some disastrous things happened when, that <laughs> when they went on air as well. Well, Kevin Colson, I remember when you left Melbourne to go overseas, uh, the advertising agency that handled the Benson and Hedges account looked everywhere to find a replacement for you because at that time you were doing all the cinema and television advertising for Benson and Hedges. Mm -hmm. Wherever life is fresh, young, vital, and the plain 
taxi down the airport. And uh, the last two uh, that they could come up with was Kevin Sanders and myself. And I won the account by a nose. Well done. Yes. Well done to you. Well, hang on. I thought I thought Stuart Wankstaff was always the Benson and Hedges uh, no, man. This is Stuyvesant, an offshoot. Oh, yes. Yes, I did, I did Peter Stuyvesant. That's right, yes. Did all the Stuyvesant commercials. Uh, light up a Stuyvesant, you'd be so glad you did. Because that's a thing of the past now, isn't it? I imagine it is, all that kind of advertising. Absolutely. Do that. You know, you're not supposed to drag on a cigarette either. Oh, of course. It's quite illegal in most places around the country. Would you say, with all your television and your radio and your ads, you're happier with what you're doing now, Kevin, uh, with aspects of love and uh, associated productions than you've ever been? I could not be happier. I could not be happier. I am really, really so delighted to be strutting my stuff on the stage. I think I'm doing reasonably well at, uh, at this particular job. I know that the particular part I'm playing now, as George Dillingham in Aspects of Love at the Comedy, is is a treasure of a part for me. And when you get to my age, you know, I'm, I'm pushing the wrong end of the candle now, aren't I? I'm uh, up in mid-50s, and uh, you don't get a lot of great parts coming along, and this to me is a great part and a great play and a great musical. A far cry from the days of Graham Kennedy's in Melbourne tonight. Do you have fond memories? I do. I mean, we co-hosted the Tuesday night. Of course. Right? Yes, we did. Wasn't that fun? And when I left, what did, what did you... What, tell me what you did. <laughs> did you stay on television for a long time? Yes, I stayed at GTV till about 1970, first time around. But by then, I guess you were a star on the West End. Is it true that Noel Cow took a shine to you and gave you a bit of a, a, a nudge along? Gave you, you know, a, help, a helping hand? He was there and available too, he said, as, you know, as a friend. He remained a friend until he died. I first met him when I did Sail Away, his musical here in Melbourne, and then we toured with that. And he came out for the last two weeks of rehearsal and was, was just so great uh, in the way he helped all of us. And it was only by chance uh, that I ran into him again in Cannes during the film festival in 1965 in May on that fateful journey across to Europe. And I was dared by a few people I was on the beach with to get in touch with him, and I did. And he fondly remembered me and invited me around for drinks at the, uh, at the Carlton in Cannes and uh, introduced me to his guests at the table. And there I was sitting with Otto Preminger and Hugh O'Brien, my great hero of this, of this series, Wired Up, um, uh, Rex Harrison, Rachel Roberts, all of these people sitting around the table. I was a gog. I'd only just got off a boat from Australia thinking, where am I going to go now? And here I was sitting with the greats and having drinks with Noel Card and his friends. And he he then encouraged me to, um, to meet a lot of people that he knew. He said, you'd be silly if you don't use me. I know a lot of people like Lionel Bart and Gilgood, Olivier. I mean, if you want an introduction, just tell me and I'll put you together with them. When I went to Paris, he rang the manageress of Pierre Balmain, Madame Seidman, or Jeanette Spanier, as she was known, and uh, I was invited to a showing of Pierre Balmain's latest collection, and then back to tea with uh, Jeanette Seidman, come Spanier. Um, she had a kind of trade name and a married name, to meet her house guest, who happened to be Claudette Colbert. I mean, this is <laughs> quite wondrous. And my very first night in London, I went to the theatre with Noel Coward and Sir Lawrence Olivier and sat in the theatre, the, the National Theatre and uh, watched Much Ado About Nothing with Maggie Smith and Albert Finney and sat there. First night in London. I mean, who would have expected it? When I left, I was just going on spec thinking, what shall I do when I get there? And here I was sitting with the gods of theatre. Wondrous. You must have been thrilled to the back teeth. I mean, to have kept your feet on the ground with all those great names and great company. It was just great. And I was very fortunate in getting work immediately when I got to, to England. And, um, and life has been good over there. That's why I've stayed. Well, was Noel Coward the dry, droll, tongue-in-cheek type person uh, in, in real life as we knew him on screen and stage? Yes. A gentle, funny, always there with a, with, with a, with a dry line just to sort of brighten up the evening. <laughs> Had time for everybody. Everybody, from the greatest stars down to the smallest little ingenue in the, in the company, or the smallest member of the ensemble. He was there to give them his time and his help and, and the uh, wealth of experience that he had. He wanted to share with everybody. He loved people. And I think most of the great, great people are that generous with their time. It's those, only those people who are sort of putting on an air of stardom that uh, want to be alone.
Our special guest is Kevin Colson, back in Melbourne for the first time in 28 years. Kevin, did you um, regret not having gone to London earlier? You know, due to the instant success, you were an overnight sensation. Perhaps you shouldn't have stayed here so long oh, no. on Channel 9. Oh, no, I definitely needed that experience and that work here. And I, you know, I, I enjoyed that. I, I feel that sort of fate or God takes a hand in your life and just tells you when to move on. And I just move when I just, when I feel the urge. I don't really make a plan to do things and I have not made a plan to come back to Australia. It is just a feeling which I, I just feel the time is right now to, to, to stay on here after Aspects of Love. Hopefully Aspects will go on some time. I did want to say about Aspects particularly, if you forgive me getting on to that particular point, it seems that in Melbourne there is a Phantom of the Opera syndrome where people feel that an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical is impossible to get into and that it's sold out all the time. Well, I'm, I've got to tell you that we're doing a limited 12-week season, and there are still plenty of seats available if anyone wants to come. So don't don't think that we are sold out for the season. Uh, we, we want to stay here for a little longer, of course, but we are limited to 12 weeks, and we've got lots of seats available. I'm not saying it's going badly. Everyone is loving the show, but don't fear that you can't get a seat. You can, and I want you to come along and see the show, and I hope you will too, Philip. Well, it's true what you say. There's a certain syndrome about these shows, uh, i.e. Phantom of the Opera. Oh, let's not worry about it. We'll, we'll never be able to get in. And, uh... I think that's passed on to aspects, and, uh, and therefore people are loath to book, and they're just wandering around the city and thinking, where should we go tonight? They wander by aspects, and they find that there are seats, and they're coming in, so we're filling up the house that way by people coming in on the night. But... Uh... You know, our management are going to say, oh dear, if the bit bookings aren't that good, we might take this show off. Well, you'll flood them after this, uh, after your comment tonight, you'll flood the uh, flood the box office. Indeed, everyone's loving it. Of course. Uh, you spoke earlier of the sunset and the dandenongs tonight, which must have been beautiful in our, in our Indian summer that we're enjoying. It, any aspects of Melbourne that suddenly struck you on, a, on arrival back after 28-odd years and you've, you've looked at it? Maybe buildings or way of life television theatre? I haven't really had enough time, Philip, to immerse myself in the city that much. We came in straight into the theatre, into rehearsal, a great deal of publicity to promote the show because we wanted people to know that we were here, this new Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. Um, I just love the gentleness of the city. I mean, it, it is a gentle, all-embracing city. Um, Sydney seems to be rushing by you and, and people haven't got time to stop and say hello, but I've found people here so genuine and so generous with their time and I'm staying in a delightful part of Melbourne, uh, very close to the city and I walk into the theatre each night through Fitzroy Gardens from East Melbourne where I'm staying and I just love the parks, the people, the city itself, which is not a big city. Uh, and it's, but it's not a grand city in that it's all imposing and, and it's going to sort of tread all over you and smother you. I just find it embraces you and, and makes you feel very comfortable and I can't think when I've been so comfortable as I am now. Yes, well, Bruce and I are delighted you're back, Kevin. Did you pursue your television career in London? Not a lot, no. I did some television acting, but I never did anything like what I did on the Nine and the Seven Network here. I didn't do any presenting. I did television series, television plays, television dramas. That's all I've ever done. Any films? Any movies? I've done the odd movie. I had an exciting moment after... I mean, I did have a break from the theatre when I went into business uh, and got involved in the exploration for the oil exploration of the North Sea. But that's another story, and that's 16 years of my life between 69 and 85. But while I was establishing that career and that business interest, about five, four years after I'd left the theatre, uh, my agent rang up and said that Elizabeth Taylor's uh, agent had been on the phone and uh, that she, she and her director wanted to meet me on location of her latest film with regard to, her, to me playing her husband. And I thought this was an April Fool's joke, of course. So I told my agent to go jump in the lake. But she came straight back to me and said, no, it's a definite appointment, but you go and see her. Subsequently, I went to see Elizabeth Taylor, Brian Hutton, the director of this movie called Night Watch, which was Lawrence Harvey's last movie. And uh, she looked at me and we talked and she said, yes, I, I want you to play the part. Here's the script, would you want to go and read it? I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll take the script, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. 
at home and rang everybody and said, I'm playing Elizabeth Taylor's, in a, Taylor's husband in a film. I'm so excited. And it was only after all these delighted phone calls that I then picked up the script and read it and found that I was her dead husband. Oh, no. And my only scenes with Elizabeth Taylor were as a corpse in a morgue where she had to lift back the seat and say, yes, that's him. Oh, of course, had been dallying with some little blonde strumpet and killed under the opening credits in a car crash. I'll bet you were glad they thought of you, Kevin. <laughs> well, I'm just a wonderful dead body. I mean, you've seen me on television. I'm always half dead, aren't I? Uh, no, look, it's been lovely recounting a lot of memories with you tonight and uh, continued success with aspects of love and uh, just generally good luck for the future. Thank you very much, and the same to you. And I hope you'll come along and see the show and come back at stage afterwards and give me your reaction. Yes, we will. And, of course, as you say, a limited season of 12 weeks at the Comedy Theatre. Kevin Colson starring in Aspects of Love. Book now.